Amen, folks. Good to be here. Amen. Looks like we got a few folks that remembered to spring forward with their their clocks. <laughs> All right. Father, I pray, Lord, for the gift of teaching. I pray you'd give me wisdom this morning. Pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 23. Romans 1, 23. Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 23. Scripture says, and he changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Now we have an image that's brought into our consideration. Look in Revelation chapter number 13, verse 14. Revelation thirteen fourteen, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. We've got an image. This image is a very important thing here. Chapter number 13, verse 15. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should, not, should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Verse, chapter 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image... And receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Verse 11, chapter 14. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Chapter 15, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Reference over and over again, chapter 16, verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And then chapter 19, verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive to a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And then finally, chapter 20, verse 4. I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, as they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The book of Revelation makes many references to the image. And I want to tell you something. I think we'd be, we need to be looking at this because we're living in the time when uh, this scripture is going to be fulfilled. At least we're right before it. We're right at it. We're close. I don't know when the Lord's going to come back. And nobody knows that hour. Nobody, but I don't believe we have a whole lot of time left before the coming of the Lord. The image. So what is the image? Well, if you can make a man, if you can make a man, 
And uh, there's a lot of different ways now that they're, uh, they're approaching this. Man was made in the image of God. If you can create your own man, then you can create your own image. If you have a devil, Satan, who comes up, look at chapter number 13 of Revelation. Revelation 13, verse 3. Revelation 13, 3. And I saw one of, the, one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power to the beast. They worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him. They're, all, they're literally overcome and overwhelmed with the power of the Antichrist here in the, uh, the book of Revelation. The devil's sneaky, folks. Very, very sneaky. Now, we've seen images many times of 666 tattooed across the forehead. The scripture says in Revelation 13, verse 16, he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. All right, now note carefully what it says here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number, six hundred, three score and six. All right, that's his number. Go back to verse 17. We have mark, name, and number. So his number is three score and six, 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 six. That's the number of the Antichrist. But he's also got a name and he's also got a mark. Notice that. It doesn't say that the mark is necessarily six, six, six. It says that's his number. 666. And that number starting to show up a lot now in a lot of different places. I don't know if you ever noticed anything like this or not, but you watch television. You watch these commercials that are coming on. These things are, it's, it's obvious that they are programming people. And you'd be amazed at how many times you'll see the yin yang. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about now. Yin yang. And you'll see it associated with stuff and you think, what's it got to do with this? Medicine for high blood pressure or anything. And then yin yang shows up. I believe the reason it does is because they're identifying themselves. I believe they're identifying themselves and I believe that, uh, that they have this method of communication and that's one of the ways they do it. The corporate world's big. There's a lot of companies out there. A lot of manufacturers of medicine and so forth, you know, high Pharma, pharma. What is it called? Pharma. Uh, what is it? What? Well, pharmakia is the Greek word, but what's it called? Big, big pharma. Yeah, big pharma. And uh, there's a powerful thing, folks. There's a lot of lobbying going on. You know what I'm talking about? Let me tell you how lobbying works. You go out there and get in your automobile, and you have to you have to uh, put your seatbelt on, right? You had to put your seatbelt on. Uh, I bought cars back in the 50s that didn't even have seatbelts. People used to carry their children in their lap in the front seat. Well, I'm not recommending that at all to anybody. But that's the way it was. Now, now, you, can, uh, you, have, this, you have this official, official statement from the state saying don't text while you drive, right? That's just for public consumption. That doesn't mean a thing. That works on the honor system. Nobody has any honor. You will say, well, what, why don't they do something about it? Lobby. 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 There's a lot of money. There's a lot of big money in cell phones. Go out and look at these cell phone towers. We've got 5G coming up. 5G is an entirely different system. All right? So when you text in your car, you talk on the phone in your car, and, and uh, send emails in your car, and all of that, uh, a man almost killed me the other day. 
He came across the center line. He was headed right for me, and I was looking for a ditch. I was, look, I was looking for a ditch. And he caught himself at the last moment and, and swerved back into the, into the road. Packing around, texting, okay? Well, what can they do about it? They can put a chip in your car. They can put a chip in the phone. They can put something in there that immediately, the moment you start that automobile, it kills the phone. But then you turn it off and you can use your phone again in case of an emergency. They can do that. They won't do that. They won't do that because they're making money. If it doesn't make sense, somebody's making money. You are being controlled by, by uh, super, uh, uh, extranational, supranational, what they call them, uh, organizations and companies, multinational. They're located all over the world, and they're making money. And they're making a lot of money. They're preparing people to receive the mark. They're brainwashing people by desensitization to receive the mark. And I'm watching it develop. And I've been around a while, been here long enough to see this stuff as it's developing before your very eyes on television. I marvel at how blatant they are in your face with this. And they're preparing people to receive the mark and his name and his number. So the idea is that the devil is going to have an image. Satan will have an image. And we find a type of it in the Old Testament when Nebuchadnezzar raised up an image in the plains of Dura. You remember that? And they told them, if you don't worship this image at the sound of the sackbut and the psalter and the, and, and the harp and all of that, if you don't fall down and worship this image, you'll be thrown in a fiery furnace. Had Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah refused to do that. And they wound up being thrown into a furnace. Did not we throw three into that furnace? I look and there's four in there now. One likened to the Son of God. So this image is a thing that we, that, we, that we see develop. Now, Nimrod was the first. Nimrod was the first type of the Antichrist in the whole Bible. First type. First type. And he was the leader of Babylon. He's the one who founded Babylon. And when God called Abram, where did he call him from? He called him out of Babylon. He called him from Ur of the Chaldees. The Chaldeans were the priest class of the Babylonians. That's who they were. They were the stargazers. They were the ones who kept track of, this, of the, uh, like we were talking about the other day, the procession of the equinox and all of that. The, the Chaldeans were the priest class. Now when you go back in the book of Genesis, you'll find that when the sons of God saw the daughters of men, they came in. They cohabited with them and giants were born. Remember I told you about the giants. You can find them in Isaiah chapter 26. He says in Isaiah 26, he visited them and he destroyed them. Why? They were neither human nor angel. They were hybrids and God destroyed them. But why did the angels come into the daughters of men? Three things. Number one is the angel. Number two is Satan. Number three is the purpose of God. God's purpose is always higher than anything else, and he will always work it to the glory of God. What was, what was Satan trying to do? He was assaulting the image of God in man. That's what he was doing. He was coming after the image of God. You see, if all mankind was a hybrid uh, hybrid being from angelic intervention then you've lost the manhood you've lost men see they're no longer men they're creatures now I know some people think well this preacher's crazy to talk like that no I'm not crazy the Bible says Noah was perfect in his generations perfect the Hebrew word is tanim it means that he was a direct descendant of Adam through Seth not Cain Therefore, he was a perfect human being that had been born in the genealogy and the line of Adam through Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. When, when, Noah was, when Noah came into this world, his father Enoch called him Noah, and his name means rest. God will give us rest through Noah. Noah preached 120 years. Now, here's something you all need to think about. When that flood came... How many of the descendants of Adam, through his bloodline, died in the flood? 
You ever thought about that? Now we know Noah didn't die in the flood. And we know that all of the all of the men leading up to Noah, every one of them, they lived out their lives. Methuselah was nine hundred and sixty nine years old when the flood came. His name means when he is dead it will be sent, or when he's when he's when he dies it will come. You know, a lot of different takes, but that's exactly that's that's essentially what it means. All right, so Noah, so Methuselah passes away 969 years after the prophecy is given. He passes away. God gave him a thousand years almost. Prophecy, he passes away. And Noah goes on, builds an ark, gets on that ark, travels from the old world into the new, eight souls. I wonder how many of Adam's descendants. I'm not talking about through Cain. I'm not talking about the rebellious lion. I'm not talking about these people. They died in the flood. And I'm not talking about the, uh, the, 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 the giants where the sons of God came to the daughters of men. They died in the flood. I'm talking about the direct descendants of Adam. You think it's possible that they were all gone and Noah was the last one left? You think so? I think that's a very good possibility that every last one of them were gone and Noah was the only one left, Noah's wife, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. I think that was it. That's all that was left. They went from the old world into the new world. So what did God do? He preserved a pure bloodline so Genesis 3.15 could be fulfilled. Genesis 3.15 is the promise of the coming Mashiach, the Messiah. So what did Satan do? Satan was trying to thwart, he was trying to put an end to the, to the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. And in doing so, he was literally assaulting the image of God in man, right? Because, a, because, <coughs> because an angel, a hybrid, a, human, a, a half man and a half, uh, <coughs> a half angel, it's not in the image of God. Not in the image of God. Only a pure human being. Now let me ask you a question this morning. Are you a pure human being? <laughs> so, well, I don't know, preacher, am I? <clears throat> Are you a human being? A lot of people out here today, they're teaching that reptiles, the reptilians running around. They're showing videos on YouTube of slanted eyes. And, 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 they, and they start naming people and all of this stuff. Folks, I believe that an awful lot of stuff is put in here solely to deceive people and confuse people. I believe its, it's sole design is to confuse. You remember the Mandela effect when that showed up? Do you remember the effect it had on people? It caused people to disbelieve the Bible. You, where it says over there in Isaiah, the lion shall lie down with the lamb. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't, but that's what you see. You've seen, a lot of, you've seen a lot of art where the lion lies down with the lamb. But according to Isaiah chapter number 11, is the wolf that lies down with the lamb, right? Okay, so they use something like that, and they call it the Mandela effect. All right, and then of course now this last assault is this is this round globe that we're on. We got all these people out here that are, we got a lot of them that are flat earthers. They believe the earth is flat. If you do, that's fine. But there's an awful lot of people out there that you're going to have to convince otherwise that have seen this round globe. They photographed it and they videoed it. And there's not a word in the Bible that teaches it. But here's the point. Here's the point. What's this doing? It's pitting Christian against Christian, and there's no need for it. It's creating a lot of confusion in the church, and there's no need for it. See, there's no need for that. I've, most people say to me, well, I don't care if it's flattered round. What difference does it make? There's a lot of people out there. That may be your position. But we have people who are trying to convert me and make me accept the flat earth. And I, I don't believe it. I don't believe in the flat earth. I believe the earth is a globe. I believe it's out here. There's a lot of different reasons, but the procession of the equinox was one reason. I was looking the other day, this fellow took off and he flew all the way around the globe. And I don't remember, 
he, I think he's the only one that ever did it, the first one that did it. And it was, a, it was a very wide winged aircraft, so it gave him a lot of lift. But he couldn't fly real fast. But he flew all the way around the globe. Now, folks, he went around the globe. If the earth was flat, he'd get out there to the end. See, they teach that the outside perimeter of this flat earth, the water is held in by ice. Okay, so the North Pole, the South Pole, all the ice of the North Pole and all the ice of the South Pole doesn't exist the way we see it on a globe. It's all, it's all out here on the edge to keep the water from running off. <laughs> off of the edge. I, I kid you not. That, that's what they teach. They have to figure, they've got to put the ice somewhere and they've got to keep the water in there somehow. And because, you see, they don't, they don't, believe, uh, they don't believe what uh, um, Isaac Newton, when he... When he uh, you remember the theory that Isaac Newton came out with? You remember what he, you can't measure it, there's, there's no, there's no uh, electrical measurement for it. It's called gravity. Gravity. That's what's holding you down on this planet. Gravity. Somebody asked me the other day, well, so what about the people on the bottom down there? On the bottom of the planet? Say, so why don't they fall off? Gravity is holding them. So why doesn't the water fall off? Gravity is holding it. See, but they come out with all these arguments. And uh, I just feel bad about it. And the reason I feel bad about it is because it's not necessary. It's not, a, it's not, it's not necessary at all. But this is the way Satan operates. So Satan had his own devices to stop the, the, the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 in the process, whether he understood it or not, he was trying to destroy the image of God in man. Now here we are today through DNA. Did you know what they're getting ready? They already, they've already done it, as a matter of fact, not getting ready. They have performed an operation on a living, I like to call them fetuses, I call them babies. You know, they go from an embryo to a baby, not a you know, fetus is, is, is what's that mean? But they have, they have operated on a baby alive inside its mother's womb and they did CRISPR on that baby. In other words, they, they, uh, they altered the genetic code of a living baby inside its mother's womb that had never been done before. In fact, the matter is just a few years ago CRISPR wasn't even, didn't even exist. They have CRISPR, and then the, another branch of it is CRISPR-Cas9, and it's the ability to go in there and edit the genetic code of a human being to produce, if you want a designer baby, or if you have some kind of fault that, that, you know, that, you're, that you're born with, all kinds of things happen and develop. And with CRISPR, there's a great possibility that you can be able to fashion a human being in the way you want them to be. Not only fashion them, but you can have a, ch a human being, you, you can get to the point where you don't even need a woman's uterus. Don't need that anymore, or the womb. What you'll do now is have this artificial womb, you'll impregnate the ovum, the egg, with a sperm. The sperm will be a man-made structure that's been programmed and so the ovum, the egg, same thing, and then you plant them in a uterus, which is out here a machine, and then nine months later the baby's born. Therefore it was born and didn't have an earthly father, didn't have an earthly mother, and, and when it comes into this world, what is it? Is that a human being? That's what you're getting into. And see, folks, whether you believe in the second coming of the Lord, whether you believe in the rapture, whether you believe any of this, it's not going to change this fact. They are moving quickly into an, into an area that is totally unknown, and they've never been there before. Never. Yes. Yes, sir. Again. I believe that the angels, I believe an angel's been given way too much credit. 
Look over here in the book of Hebrews. Chapter uh, 2, verse 6. Angels are given way too much credit. Don't you think about this for a moment. The scripture says in the Old Testament that your spirit is in your nostrils. In other words, your life. Nefesh, the life in the Old Testament. Okay? That is in your nostrils. What does that mean, preacher? That means that you are vulnerable, that, you're, that your life is fragile, and that your life can be wiped out. Boom! You can be shot and you drop dead, you're gone, see. But it doesn't say anywhere that the life of an angel is in its nostrils. Why? Because an angel has an entirely different life than you do. All right. You know why? Because no angel is created in the image of God. But you are. He breathed into your nostrils a breath of life. You became a living soul. God made a man in the image of God. He gave you a special existence. And here's what he says about a man. Now look at this. This question he asked about the angels. We'll put them together in a moment. Look at verse number, uh, verse number 5. Get the context here. Hebrews 2. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. Okay. There's a world coming. And he said he did not give it to the angels to rule over it. Look at verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man? What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man, that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. See, in power and might especially, because that's what it says about an angel. They are greater in power and might than we are. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor. God made humanity, men, to be kings, to be rulers. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Adam, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over everything that moves on the earth. I give you dominion over that. It is a natural thing when a man reigns on the earth. It is not natural when an angel reigns over the earth. But they want to. Look at verse number 8. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Now hold your place right there. Go back to verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. He plainly tells you that angels have not been given this great power and authority to rule over the world to come. But to the man, he says, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Okay. But now we, but now we see not all things put under him. Not yet. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Now watch the contrast. Watch this. But we see Jesus. Now look at this. Who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Did you see that? Do you see how he connects the Lord Jesus with man? Why? Because Christ was a man. That's why. He was a man. And he earned the right to rule over the earth. He earned it. He earned it. And he earned it as a man. You see all these things that Christ has and what he does and all the future that holds for him and the glory, all of that, he purchased with his own blood and his perfect life on this earth 2,000 years ago. As the second person of the Trinity, he could say the word and call 12,000, 12, 000, 12 uh, a manner of legions. He could, he could, he could, you know, he's got the power of God. He's the Almighty. But not one time did he ever use that power when he was here. So look at verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Watch this. Crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him, 
for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Here we are. Our brother mentions these angels, these fallen angels. They want to reign. They do. And they did reign through Nimrod. He was demon possessed. And see in the book of Genesis, Nimrod becomes the ruler of all the earth. Literally, he was a worldwide ruler. And he's the one that created Babylon, the city, Babylon. He didn't create Babel, where God changed their languages, but he created Babylon. And what did he create it for? He created it to rule over the earth. The Bible said he was a hunter of men before the Lord. That's Nimrod. Now you can get off into Nimrod and you can find it. There's an awful lot of stuff that has to do with Nimrod. Nimrod is associated with supernatural powers ruling and reigning over this earth. Principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's who Nimrod is connected with. Out of Nimrod comes all of these, all of these uh, titans and gods, the Greeks and the Romans and all of this stuff. They come from Nimrod, Semiramis, from Babylon, from that time. And what are they here for? They're here as gods, you see, to reign over men. Now, there's a strange statement set over here in the book of, of Psalms about this. And let's look over there at it. The book of Psalms, chapter 82, and verse 1. Psalm 82, and verse number 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. All right? Now, you've got to watch this word, this Hebrew word Elohim. Okay? Elohim. Bereshith bara Elohim. That's the first three words of the Hebrew Bible. In the beginning, God. Notice how that it is in the singular, yet the word Elohim is a plural Hebrew noun. means three or more. Well, let's get that. That's what it means. That's a genetic, generic meaning of the word Elohim. The word Elohim is not like Jehovah. Elohim is not the name of God. It is simply a reference to a spirit being. Okay. That's what we got here. We have, he stands in the congregation. He uh, stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the Elohim. Notice it's plural here now because there's many of them, gods. Okay, now look at this. Look at verse 2. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, Selah? How many of you remember reading from the book of Daniel? When Daniel prayed for a, he prayed for a messenger to come, he prayed for... God to send someone that could help him. And he prayed and turned his face toward the Lord and he repented and confessed all the sins of his people. And the Lord sent a messenger. He sent one. But it took him 21 days to get to Daniel. And you know why? He had opposition, didn't he? He said, the prince of Persia I was withstood by. In other words, I had to confront. In plain words, he said, I had to fight on a spiritual level that is above what's happening on this earth. I had to deal with it. I, had to, I was confronted by this. And it took me 21 days to get to you. He said, from the moment you prayed, God heard your prayer and God answered your prayer. But this came. So what's going on here? It is this battle that rages above us. It's this battle that's raging. And it's still raging. For until, the Bible said in the book of uh, Revelation, chapter number 11, when the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. When does that take place? At the second advent. Remember, the second advent's a long, drawn-out thing. It's got a lot in it. So when the Lord comes back, He's going to take the kingdoms of this world. 
That means principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and high places and all of this other stuff, princes of Persia and all the rest of this, will be stripped of their power. But right now, right now, they're ruling. It's, they're usurpers. They were never given this. But look what he says to them in Psalm. Look carefully at it. Verse 30, verse, Psalm 82, verse 3. Defend the poor, fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. In other words, if you're going to be here, if you're taking this, I'm going to judge you for every part of your existence. And God does. You see, God's a, God's a righteous judge. He's just. We're not, but he is. He never judges anything by emotion. He judges it based on righteousness. Look at verse 3. Defend the poor, the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and, afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and the needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, Elohim, and all of you are children of the Most High. All right. What it says in the book of Job, when the sons of God shouted for joy. He's, they're called the sons of God in the book of Job. Who, who are these sons of God? They're angels. The angels were made before the earth was made. They were made before man. And they rejoiced when they saw the creation come into existence. He said, look at this now. I've said you're gods and all of your children are the most high. But ye shall do what? Die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Now, there's a lot of people that say, well, this is a direct reference to earthly rulers. It may have some reference to that, but it goes much deeper than that. You've got to remember, Scripture, many of the Scriptures in the Bible have a double application. In the Old Testament, he said, I've called my son out of Egypt. Who's his son? His son was Israel. He said, Moses, he said, when you go stand before Pharaoh, he says, you say this to him. Israel is my son. Let my son go. He never said that. Never, you can't find where he ever said it. But Israel spiritually was the son of God in the Old Testament. You see, that was his sons and daughters. So the prophecy said, I will call my son out of Egypt. Did he? Sure he did. After 400 years, he called them out. But then you come to the New Testament and the New Testament writer, and I think it's Matthew, quotes that very scripture when the Lord Jesus Christ had been taken down into Egypt to flee from Herod. He quotes that same scripture again and says, has called my son out of Egypt. And the Lord Jesus is coming out of Egypt. What do you got? You got a double application of that same scripture. And I think that's what you've got here in Psalm 82. You've got a double application. You've got an earthly ruler, but you've got the one that's higher than him. Let me give you an indication of that. Look over here in the book of Isaiah. Let's, let's see. Let's look at uh, see the eyes here, Ezekiel. Let's go to Isaiah chapter number 7. It's either that or Ezekiel 28. Okay. All right, let's, all right, let's go to 14, Isaiah 14. Oh, okay, verse 4. Isaiah 14, 4. Thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased, so forth and so on. Come on down to verse 11. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vows, the worm is spread over thee, the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the earth, or to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Now, wait a minute. Who are we talking to here in Isaiah 14? We're talking to the king of Babylon. You get a liberal commentary... And he'll tell you that 
Lucifer is simply a spiritual represent, representation of the king of Babylon. That there is no devil. That a devil did not exist. That a devil is a created being. That he, the reason that the Jews and the Israelites in the Old Testament started talking about a Satan or a devil is because they got it, it would, they got it from the Zoroastrians over in Persia and, and Babylonians and all this other foolishness. But here in the Bible, which I believe, the Bible, we're speaking to the king of Babylon and then God just speaks right above him to the one who is energizing the king of Babylon, to the one who's giving life to the king of Babylon. See this? Here's a man. God speaks to that man, then he goes above him. John 8, 44. What did he say to them? John 8, 44. He said, you are of your father, the devil. Okay? Their, their father was the devil. The devil energized them. He gave them their spirit, their life. And so it is here with this one. And you find that over and over and over again. Where the Bible speaks to a human being. But then it raises it up to a higher level. To a higher level. And uh, that's what happens in Babylon. That's what's, uh, that's what's happening into the modern Babylon. It's quite a thought. Anybody might know who modern Babylon is. There's two or three different uh, theories. You have a uh, spiritual Babylon. You have a a uh, uh, Babylon that deals with uh, produce and commerce, and then you have a physical Babylon. Three of them. The United States of America, on a lot of levels, would fit perfectly as Babylon. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. Thanks be unto God for this man here in the state of Tennessee. I don't remember who he is, but he's a, he's, a, he's a state representative here in Tennessee or a state senator. Do you know what he just did? He presented a bill to the state uh, legislature that would, that would, that would uh, essentially stop uh, drag queens from going into the uh, uh, libraries and schools and so forth and, and, so, and what have you. And the purpose, of course, is to recruit. That's what they're doing, is to recruit. And so he has presented a bill here in the state of Tennessee to stop that. God bless him and hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That's a wonderful thing. Amen. Protect our children. All right. We'll come to a close here. We'll <coughs> be back out here in a few minutes for the service. Brother Van Caldwell, you dismiss us.